This is The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyade. The BBC has just announced that it'll show a new adaptation of Tolstoy's War and Peace next year, hot on the heels of the cinematic production of Anna Karenina, starring Kira Knightley and Jude Law. But do these screen versions of great Russian novels do the books justice? And is there any point trying to stay faithful to the originals anyway? To get to grips with these issues, I invited Anna Fomichova, who is a film writer, and Claire Knight, who is lecturer in modern European history at King's College London and is also completing a PhD in Soviet cinema at Cambridge, into the studio. It's difficult making novels into films, but there are particular issues, aren't there, with converting big Russian novels like War and Peace and Anna Karenina into films. Do you think that producers in the UK or America bring authentic interpretations of these books to the big screen? Or is it even worth trying to be authentic at all? I'd like to start with you, Claire. Of course, authenticity is a complex term um, that can be interpreted in, in loads of different ways. We can think of historical authenticity. Is it accurate? Are the um, the costumes sort of accurate to the period? Are the sets accurate to how homes and that sort of thing would have been decorated at the time? We can think in terms of cultural accuracy. Does the adaptation convey the same sorts of philosophical, political, economic debates that were going on at the time? Or we can think of accuracy, the more nebulous accuracy of the soul of the novel, which can be interpreted in many different ways. We often hear in uh, Russian literary circles about the Russian soul. And the argument there is that only only a Russian can really convey the truth of the Russian soul. And so on in those terms, then yes, I would say Westerners uh, do have a, a real challenge before them. But if we think in terms of authenticity as just creating a cohesive whole where the subtlety and the complexity of the Russian novel is is given sort of due opportunity to um, to be expressed, then absolutely a Western director has as much of an opportunity to uh, to succeed in that area as as a Russian director. Anna, you are Russian, although you live and work in the UK. What do you think about Western directors taking on Russian novels? I think I agree with Claire that there is no reason why Western directors can't approach or can't make good adaptations of of Russian literature. But uh, historically, Russians traditionally certainly have looked rather dismissively on those attempts, uh, quite unfairly, I think. But going back to the original question in terms of, you know, how difficult it is and what are the challenges that filmmakers face when adapting big Russian novels, I think Anna Karenina in that sense is a great example because it's a, it's a book of incredible complexity with many layers and, you know, Tolstoy tries to get inside people's minds and, and address uh, philosophical issues about people's relationships um, and in, interactions. And in order to do that, he contrasts and juxtaposes two sets of relationships. We get sort of the tragic side, the unhappy family of Karenins and, you know, Vronsky as the part of the, the love triangle. And then we have Kitty and Levin, who represent a happy, happy relationship. And of course, this juxtaposition is what Tolstoy announces with his very first sentence in the novel, happy families versus unhappy families. But I think, you know, as far as film industry is concerned, nobody wants to look at happy families. Nobody's interested in happy relationships. We want drama, we want drive, we want um, action in a way. This is why the Keaton and Levin line has always been sidetracked and reduced. And if we look at all the adaptations of Anna Karenina, that is certainly the case with all of them. And the recent one by Joe Wright is, I think, takes it to a perfect logical extreme in the sense that it, it leaves us with the basic melodrama of the Anna and Vronsky story and focuses on sets and costumes more than, more than anything else. Well, yes, a, a few people have said that, though it has divided the critics. Claire, what did you think of how that adaptation worked, the latest Anna Karenina? Yeah, I thought it was uh, fantastic as an adaptation. I saw it when I was only a third of the way through the novel and preparing to teach the novel as a, as a way of approaching late imperial Russian history. So I was definitely reading and watching with a sort of critical eye, with a more kind of scholarly eye rather than, you know, the, the normal mode of wanting to be entertained when I went to the cinema. And in that mode, then, I, I thought it was absolutely 
absolutely fantastic because it actually went beyond the the realm of the the normal adaptation, which is simply attempting to either be faithful to the novel or to make a statement with it and sort of um, overcome the expectation that an adaptation should be faithful to a novel or should be only judged on those terms. And instead, it, it actually engaged with the full realm of cinematic possibility, not only with, you know, the sights and the sounds and the movement of cinema, but also by, by setting so much of the novel in a basically a theoretical space in the, uh, the theater as a metaphor for society, for Russian society at the time, and, and really drawing on that metaphor that Tolstoy himself develops to such an extent in the novel in which scholarship has picked up on as one of the major contributions of this novel to the Russian literary canon. And in particular, sort of Gary Yon has looked at this, at this, uh, this theme of society as, as a place where you need to perform, where you're always on stage. And the adaptation picked up on that. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant in that way. And we see a much more naturalistic approach to to the scenes uh, set in the countryside. And so we have that contrast that is so clear in the novel between the city and the countryside, which hasn't really been expressed as clearly, I don't think, in, in previous adaptations. And we see even um, with this use of the theater and with his, in particular, you know, the sort of madcap rapid scene changes in the background and this sort of thing, we get a whole speeding up of the scenes that are set in, in an urban area, which is also something that happens in the novel. One critic has, well, actually, it was Nabokov himself who noticed first that Anna and Vronsky live more uh, time during the novel. They live for four years throughout the novel, whereas Kitty and Yovin live for just over three years. And we can see that speeding up of Vronsky and Anna's time in this uh, Joe Wright adaptation as well. Everything moves more quickly. Well, it certainly does move quickly, and it's technically very, very proficient. But I didn't come away from the film caring about the characters in, in the way that I did after reading the novel. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, it's certainly the case, and many critics have uh, commented on on that aspect of the film. And to me, the, the reason that happened is because in Joe Wright's preoccupation with the the visual and the cutting and the fast cutting and fast pacing, it certainly it is very technically impressive. All of this fast movement does not leave much breathing room for characters to develop. It, it doesn't leave much room for dialogue and doesn't leave audience much time to really get involved with, with each character. And that's, that's an exact opposite, opposite to what Tolstoy does because one of his great achievements is his ability to get inside people's heads. And that's what we don't see in Joe Wright's adaptation. What about previous adaptations of Anna Karenina? Have you seen any that you rate highly? Claire? I would say that there are a number of adaptations that are, that are interesting for a particular reason. I, I think the, the 1997 adaptation is quite interesting, the one starring uh, Sophie Marceau, because there we see an ad- adaptation that truly is attempting to sort of achieve that fidelity to the original novel. And we see in particular, this, this really stands out in the, in the suicide scene, where we don't really see the suicide so much as we see visual representations of the metaphors that Tolstoy uses to describe Anna's death. And it just doesn't really work as a film. But it's very interesting as an adaptation because here it is. It's this attempt to be literal, to be true to the novel. And and it doesn't really work as a film. Anna, going back to the Joe Wright adaptation, one thing I wanted to ask you in particular about is the reaction of Moscow audiences. I'm, I'm rather fascinated by this. I know it may be the tradition to not think much of Western adaptations of Russian novels on screen, but there were particular reasons, weren't there, this time for the strong dislike of of this adaptation? This kind of bright and noisy, almost carnivalesque style that Joe Wright used for this adaptation, I think a lot of Russians felt that, especially famously, the famous Russian writer Dmitry Bukov, who's a a very outspoken critic of this film, he's he's commented on on the fact that he is personally almost uh, offended by the reduction the kind of the reductionist image of Russia that Joe Wright represented. Of course, many people get really angry, people get really annoyed about if things are not faithful enough. And I I, I think it's a a bit of a dead end argument in terms of things being faithful or unfaithful, meaning are they good or bad. I certainly admire Joe Wright's ambition. But in, in Russia, I think this is still the way to think about literary adaptations is in terms of how faithful they are. And certainly Joe Wright is probably the most kind of, is the boldest attempt to play around 
with uh, Tolstoy's novel and think about it in a different way and stylistically. And, and it, it really angered a lot of people. I do think people of older generation, generally, I think young people like this kind of almost glamorous, bright, you know, fast moving thing. And I've heard good comments from young people. But uh, yeah, older critics have, have been really genuinely hostile and almost nasty, almost aggressive towards Joe Wright's adaptation. But I suppose that's uh, understandable to a point where you've had so many adaptations of Russian novels that have reduced the country and its culture to a few gaudy images. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, Dr. Zhivago is the most classic example of that. and The, the one with Julie Christie and Emma Sharif. Yeah, exactly. By Directed by David Lean, who is, of course, the master of a big epic, you know, having directed Lawrence of Arabia and uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. So, of course, he, he took it all very seriously and he made a huge epic that is too saccharine, you know, I think, for Russian view. And, of course, there are some absolutely hilarious, almost absurd inaccuracies like um, the famous onion domes on top of Zhivago's house, which, you know, of course, onion domes are a feature of churches and cathedrals and not people's houses. But David Lean shoots it in a very kind of picturesque way, saying, you know, look how beautiful this is. And of course, all the Russians watching it are, you know, spitting at it and this is laughing. Spitting or laughing. Do you think this is about something deeper about the failure of people in the West to understand Russian culture or want to understand it? Certainly in the case of Dr. Zhivago, it was made in 1960s. And I mean, there wasn't much access to it and there wasn't much knowledge. I'm sure if they had the opportunity to shoot in Russia, they wouldn't wouldn't have picked the, the onion domes and so on. And I think... Another issue with that film is, of course, that it is set during the the Civil War, one of the biggest tragedies in Russian history. And to treat it in such a kind of overly sweet, saccharine way is is really a bit offensive, I think, to, to a lot of Russians. Claire, the BBC is about to adapt War and Peace again. What do you think our chances are of getting something a bit better than Dr Zhivago in this time when people have got much more access to each other's countries? Yes, I think the chances are definitely good. I mean, we've seen the trend since the since the end of communism has been to go um, to, if not film in Russia, then to film in Slovakia or Slovenia or, you know, closest that are geographically more similar to, to the Russian landscape and that sort of thing. So that is, that's a good trend just in terms of the sort of uh, landscape auth- authenticity and, and getting the buildings right. But also I think there's been an increased interest just in audiences for, for historical accuracy in historical adaptation and in literary adaptation. So I think that's a good sign. Also, with uh, this this particular adaptation, I think they've been granted a budget of 10 million pounds, which is fantastically large for a television series. So I think that, you know, that the chances of getting sort of addressing a faithful, you know, the appearance of of Russia is, is very good. In terms of capturing Russian culture, I'm not necessarily quite so convinced. I'm a great admirer of Andrew Davies adaptations, but his tendency is to want to focus on relationships and to convert them into something that is resonant with a contemporary society. And by contemporary society, he, he means the British audience, the British uh, viewership. So in that case, I think, you know, some of the maybe some of the, the nuances of what was actually happening in Russia during the Napoleonic era are going to be lost in the pursuit of delving into the into the human relationships, which is sort of uh, Andrew Davies' tendency. Yes, well, he has said, hasn't he, that he's leaving all the philosophy out of yeah. his adaptation. And maybe that is a decision some people have to make. What do you think, Anna? Is it a shame that the difficult bits of Tolstoy get passed over? I think it's only natural because, you know, film is not literature and television is not literature. There are different uh, media altogether and there are some things that you convey on paper that you, you can't convey in film or television, especially there are so many kind of rules and regulations, especially in television in terms of time requirements and so on. I don't think, personally, I don't think it's a shame and I have high hopes for this particular a- adaptation. I wouldn't expect it to television to cover Tolstoy's philosophical musings to begin with. I wouldn't expect any visual media like this to really address that. And if, if they did, I'd happily watch that. But I think it's almost work for some kind of alternative almost kind of experimental cinema to to express philosophy visually. And finally, what about Russia's own adaptations of its big novels? Claire, have you seen any of those? 
the recent ones that have been on Russian television? I haven't seen any of the recent ones. Uh, my, my area of expertise is more in the Soviet period. So in that case, yes, I've seen a number of them. And um, they're always very instructive for, for two things. First of all, for, you know, for the novel itself and to see the methods that Soviet cinema itself was using to try to convey, as Anna said, you know, this difficult thing of, of visualizing thought, you know, and visualizing ideas. Um, so that's very interesting. We see it, the Soviet, Soviet cinema has its own traditions there. But it's particularly interesting to see what Soviet censors cut out and what they leave in, who gets adapted and who doesn't. And Tolstoy comes out the winner on all counts. So not much Dostoevsky in comparison? Not much, no. And Anna, what about you? Have you seen the latest Master of Margarita and The Idiot that have come out of Russia? I was impressed. I thought they were excellent productions. I have seen those and um, they're a bit hit and miss for me. And, you know, earlier I was talking about how Russians expect a really faithful approach to, to the to the literature uh, the director who's adapted The Idiot and Master Margaret is the same person. And in terms of the, the Idiot, I think it's a very successful adaptation. You know, it's got incredibly great uh, casting, which makes it successful, which is m- the main reason for its success. But Master Margarita, I'm not a big fan of. But Master Margarita is a difficult one because it's a novel that's famously, people have been trying to adapt it for many, many years and have failed or, you know, there's some production problems or people dying and so on. And of course, there are all sorts of talk around it about how it's uh, Bulgakov uh, beyond the grave is trying to stop people from adapting it and so on. And um, finally, you know, the recent uh, TV adaptation when it came out, it was probably the first big adaptation that uh, Russians had opportunity to see. And of course, it didn't turn out very well. And people said, well, of course, it didn't turn out well, you know, it it wasn't going to because of all this mysterious talk around it. I'm not sure whether to hope that's true or not true, but it's certainly interesting that the Russians are doing their own adaptations now, so at least they're not just relying, in in a sense, on the West to do that. I don't think there's anything inherent about Western filmmakers that they can't possibly understand the Russian soul or adapt things. You know, these novels have been really popular in, in the West, People like them. People um, read them. There's no, there's no problem in understanding the, you know, mysterious Russian soul in, in those terms. So I think it's just a question of the difficulty of adapting literature in, in general. And I, and I wouldn't say that Russian adaptations of Russian literature have been that great either. And Claire, a final word from you? I would definitely agree with Anna on that one. That was Claire Knight and Anna Fomichova talking to me, Alice Laniado, for our culture programme, Curtain Up. This is The Voice of Russia in London. Stay with us.